diabetes is a condition where your body is not able to produce a hormone called insulin or it's not able to properly use the insulin that it produces. Insulin is a hormone that's created in the pancreas that has a very important role of getting blood glucose or blood sugar into the cell to be used for energy. If blood glucose cannot enter the cell to be used for energy, your blood glucose levels will rise and over time that can lead to health complications. Similar to COVID, people with diabetes are not at higher risk of contracting or coming down with the flu or COVID for that matter. Um, so we're at equal risk of being exposed or coming down or being affected by the disease. The problem is, is that when we have diabetes and depending on our level of control, right? So poorly controlled, people with poorly controlled diabetes, people with higher sugars um, and quite honestly, increased adiposity. Um, in other words, people with overweight, um, people with obesity, those people will have, and we know about it in, as well, they have poor outcomes in COVID and they actually would also have poor outcomes generally in uh, if they were come to come down with influenza. Now, essentially, quite honestly, anybody has the chance of coming down with very serious sequelae of um, influenza. So whether it become, whether it could cause dehydration, whether it could lead to a fall, whether that could lead to a stroke, um, there are a lot of things that can happen and that um, all these complications can develop. One of the best things we can do is, is to obviously prevent um, ourselves or, or keep ourselves safe, which is, believe it or not, wearing that mask, hand sanitizing and social distancing. Um, because when we're doing all that, we're, we're far less likely to come down with almost any kind of infection generally. Um, but the other thing that we could be doing is being aware of the stay safe guidelines or the staying safe when you're sick or staying safe when you're at risk of dehydration due to vomiting and sickness. And so those kinds of website uh, information is available on the uh, diabetes.ca website, the Diabetes Canada website, as well on the guidelines.diabetes.ca website. So you can search under webinars um, and search under stay safe or sick day and all these types of things are available on the website. Having said that, please speak with your healthcare provider, any of your healthcare team. So whether it be your primary care provider, your, your, your nurse practitioner, your, your, uh, your family doctor, or whether it be your community pharmacist, your diabetes educators, all of us would be happy to individualize your care to help you stay safe and to know that if you were to come down with influenza or COVID, what are the steps you need to do to prevent those dangerous complications from ensuing? Thank you for being with me. Thank you for joining me and good luck. Let's imagine that you've just learned that there is a confirmed case of COVID-19 at your child's school. You might feel your heart rate starting to pick up, a little bit of sweat forming around your brow, and you might have this urge to pull your child out of the school. Well, much as you probably didn't make a hasty decision in making that initial choice to let your child return to in-person schooling, I'm going to encourage you to resist the temptation to pull your child out of school right away. You probably weighed a whole bunch of pieces of information when you made your initial decision. The news that you were reading or hearing, the email communications from your child's school. You probably thought a lot about your family dynamics, your work situations, and most of all, you probably thought long and hard about how your child learns best, uh, his or her need for face-to-face -face socialization, and his or her mental and physical well-being. I took a look at the various websites for the school administrations and public health agencies across Canada, and while there are some specifics that vary from location to location, there are some generalities that I can share with you. If there is a confirmed case of COVID-19 at your child's school, your school is going to work very, very closely with public health officers 
to determine who the contacts were of that person with the infection and also to arrange so that there is no further transmission to school, the staff, students, or your surrounding community. The school will communicate with you, with your students, with your child, with staff, etc., through email and even letters to let you know what steps, what measures are being taken to keep everybody safe. In the meantime, the public health officers are going to take a very detailed history from the person who has the infection to find out who her close contacts were. Now this term close contacts applies to very specific circumstances. Remember that COVID-19 virus is transmitted through large droplets, the kind that are sneezed out or coughed out um, by a person who is infected with the virus. What this means then is that if your child is in one end of the school and the person with the infection is in another end of the school or even on a separate floor completely cohorted away from your child, your child is not considered then to be a close contact. If the public health officer determines that your child is a close contact, that public health officer will indicate to you directly the steps that need to be taken next. Usually this will amount to your child self-isolating for 14 days, whether or not he has symptoms. So returning back to that original question, should you pull your child out of school if there is a confirmed case of COVID-19? Well, I can't really leave you with a simple yes or no because the circumstances can really, really vary from school to school and from person to person. I do wanna remind you though that your child having type one diabetes means that he or she has an autoimmune condition, but it doesn't mean that your child is immunocompromised, okay? So his or her risk of being infected with the COVID-19 virus is no higher than someone else who doesn't have type one diabetes. Now with that said, if your child does have another medical condition that makes her more susceptible to getting sick, uh, for example, taking immunosuppressive drugs, or if your child has an underlying respiratory condition that increases his risk, makes it more difficult to recover from a respiratory infection, I would encourage you to speak to your child's pediatrician about his or her specific risk of remaining in that school. Please visit the website for your school, for your local public health agency to find out more specifics about how the school would deal with a confirmed case of COVID-19. Thank you very much for listening today. Please stay healthy and stay well. Continuous glucose monitoring is exactly as it sounds. It's a method of monitoring your glucose that's continuous. How it works is there's a small filament that's inserted under your skin. There's a sensor that sits on top with a, a transmitter. And what happens is, is that the glucose levels are measured in the interstitial fluid, which is the fluid underneath your skin, bathing the cells, providing nutrients to them. So the continuous glucose monitoring systems read the glucose every five minutes and then they push it. So they continuously share the information to either a reader that's um, associated with the transmitter or it might be with an app on your smartphone, or it could be that you use it as part of your insulin pump and that the, the um, result goes directly to your pump. The result will tell you where your current glucose is. It will give you a trend arrow that tells you what direction your glucose is gonna head in the next 30 minutes if you don't take action. And it will also give you a history of where your glucose levels have been. So the continuous glucose monitoring system requires no action on the part of the individual wearing it. All the information is pushed to them. And they are also able to have high and low alarms, going low alarms, and there's Bluetooth technology that allows you to have your data shared with your loved one. There are many ways to cope with diabetes distress. 
One of the first things to do is acknowledge that you're feeling this. Day-to-day -day management of diabetes is certainly challenging and it's perfectly normal to feel stress, anxiety, and overwhelm. As you're looking at these experiences, try to come at it with a sense of compassion for yourself. The more we can reduce judgment and be kind to ourselves, the better off we will be. As much as possible, figure out what is essential for you and keep those routines in place. For many people, these are things such as cooking nourishing meals, moving your body in healthy ways, and getting enough sleep. Keep those in the rotation and try to cut out activities and tasks that are not essential right now. Connect with other people. This is more challenging in COVID, of course, but even a phone call, a Zoom call, or a text can help you to recognize who your supports are and to remember that you are more than just a person with diabetes. Try to notice where the places are where you have small successes. Some days this might be as simple as cooking that nourishing meal. Other days it might be getting out of bed. Celebrate those small wins because they add up and they matter too. And be present in this moment. That's not always easy, but our minds tend to feel anxious when we think too much about the future and depressed if we think too much about the past. If you notice your mind spiraling off in either of those directions, ground your feet on the floor and really take some deep, intentional, conscious breaths. That can help keep you in the present moment and stop your mind from going down those unwanted paths. Finally, don't be afraid to ask for help. That help might come in the form of a Facebook support group, contacting Diabetes Canada, or reaching out to a healthcare professional. There are people out there who can share what's worked for them and can also teach you new tools and techniques to support you in your diabetes. Life sure has changed in 2020 with many of us now moving from working in an office environment to working at home. For those of us who now work at home, there can be a dramatic change in activity. We take less steps per day, uh, walking to and from our cars or to and from transport. Our houses are usually smaller than our offices, so when we're walking around in the day, we're actually taking much less in the way of steps to go from place to place during the day. So what can we do to stay active and keep up our energy output while we're working from home? One thing that I think works really well is to have a step tracker. So this can be a pedometer that fits on your belt or a smartwatch. We often suggest 10,000 steps per day, but the goal is going to be very different for different people, uh, depending on what your uh, activity level is like. And, and often for what I recommend instead of 10,000 steps is to try to increase. So see what kind of steps you're doing in a day and then see if you can maybe increase it by 10% the next week and then move it up from there. Make sure that you take extra breaks to get up, walk around, do a lap around your house or your apartment. Uh, if you can, do a lap around your neighborhood. We really want to keep the steps up and keep that activities of daily living, as we call it, going during this time when we're working from home. We also, you know, the good news is we have a lot more time on our hands that we're not spending in public transport or in our cars. So if we can take that time and then reallocate it instead to time to be active. So there are lots of great apps for quick uh, workouts at home. There's some great videos. A lot of them uh, have free trial periods, so you can jump from one to the next if you want to try some different ones. Do remember that if you are taking on any new activity program and you're a person who uses insulin or pills called sulfonylureas or maglitinides for, as part of your diabetes treatment, make sure you talk to your educator or your physician about adjusting the dose before starting the exercise program to avoid having low blood sugars. <laughs> 